In AD 33, Jesus left and left us a mission. His spirit came to bring it to fruition. Then Peter pissed off the Sanhedrin, so Saul martyred Stephen. But Saul became Paul and went through many trials to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Soon, a new Bible began to form, its survival tested by a Gnostic swarm as Constantine took Rome by storm. Yet swift was the fall of Rome, so Augustine made heaven our true home. Dark ages, Quran's pages, the crusade rages on. Plagues near, deaths here. Dante, where have we gone? 1500, Luther thundered. God's grace was louder than the Pope's indignation. Luther launched the Protestant Reformation. If you've been paying attention, the last two Sundays, we are at the moment in history when Martin Luther split the world in half. England, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway pretty much all became Protestant. While Spain and France and Italy remained Catholic, Europe was split in half. Half of Europe followed Luther and became Protestant. The other half rejected Luther and stayed Catholic. And that arrangement worked about as well as two cats in a microwave. In AD 16, the Catholic emperor sent two delegates to go meet with the Protestants in this very building. It's still there today. They got into a disagreement. So, of course, the Protestants threw them out the window. <laughs> this window, the highest window in the building, 70 feet up, the Protestants threw the Catholics out the window. But somehow, the Catholics survived. The Catholics, they, they called it a miracle. They said, angels from God must have carried the Catholic people down and dropped them gently on the ground. God is on our side. And the Protestants said, that's a load of crap. Literally, the Protestant response was that the Catholics fell onto a pile of cow poop. <laughs> and that is how they survived. Which brings a whole new meaning to 95 Theses. <laughs> but whether it was angels, or cow poop, or a really weird mix of both, the result was the same. The Protestants had thrown a Catholic delegation out the window. Both sides began preparing for war. The Catholics struck first, winning the first battle. They took back lands and forced the people to become Catholic. And then the Protestants struck back. And then the Catholics came back. And then the Protestants. And then the Catholics. Back and forth, back and forth. The war raged. Sweat dripping, swords clanging, prayers resounding throughout the battlefield. Each group calling on its God. Each side charging for Christ. This famous artwork from the time period displays the carnage. After a battle, they hanged the survivors in a tree. And this continued from 1618 to 1648. 30 years! 30 years brother raged against brother in trenches dug out of their childhood streets. Thirty years, Catholic swords clanged against Protestant hordes. Thirty years, one year for every piece of silver Judas got for betraying Christ. Thirty years, blood streamed down those hills, drowning the wounded in themselves. So they called it, the Thirty Years' War. And Europe was tired of fighting over religion. First the Crusades, now this. 
Thirty years of war, ravaged villages, broken families, millions dead in the ditch. We're, we were tired of fighting over faith, weary of warring over religion, exhausted of executing heretics. The Thirty Years' War taught us religion can be dangerous. Religion can divide people. Religion can cause wars. We began to see public religion as dangerous. This is what happens when religion gets involved in the public sphere. We need to stop forcing people to believe what we believe. We need to coexist peacefully. We need to tolerate each other and other religions. Our governments need to be neutral. It can't take a side on religious issues. We need to be secular. The Thirty Years' War leads to secularism. Repeat after me. Secularism. secularism. That was lame. Come on. Secularism. This is really lit. <laughs> secularism. All right. Secularism says religion should stay out of the public sphere. Church and state should never mix. Religion should be a private, personal matter. When one religion tries to control the public sphere, you get things like the Thirty Years' War, and who wants that again? Secularism compartmentalizes religion into two categories. There's private religion, and there's public religion. That's what secularism says. And secularism says private religion is good. You are free to believe whatever you believe in the privacy of your own home or, you know, in the privacy of a church building. You be a Catholic, I'll be a Muslim, they'll be a Protestant. Your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. Let's not argue about it. Keep your faith to yourself. Don't talk about it in public. You don't need to advertise it. We don't need to have public discussions. Keep your faith private and we'll be fine. But as soon as you bring your religion out into the public sphere, there's going to be problems. The public sphere is out in the world. The public sphere is the street, a restaurant, the office, your school, or the government. Secularism says religion is fine in private, but if you come out in public, there's going to be problems. Public education is in the public sphere, and the public sphere should be secular. Which is why we used to pray in schools, but now we don't. They used to teach classes on theology in public schools and universities. But now we don't because of secularism. In fact, teachers today can be fired for talking about their faith with students. Secularism teaches that the church and state should also be separate. The state should not tell people what to believe, and religion should not be a factor in political decisions. The Bible should not be considered a political argument, is the position of secularism. Public religion was considered part of the dark ages that we need to leave behind. And secularism is the new light of hope for the modern age. Secularism was the rational, tolerant, open-minded way of the future. And so secularism began to grow bigger and bigger especially in France. France was deeply influenced by modern secular thinkers. In fact, secularism was one of the underlying ideologies behind the French Revolution in 1789. So in the French Revolution, one of the first things the revolutionaries did was they confiscated all church property. They tore down crosses, they destroyed monasteries, and they burned churches to the ground. They outlawed the Christian calendar and replaced it with a secular one. They went to Notre Dame Cathedral and they destroyed the Christian symbols and in their place, they built an altar with the word reason 
the new source of secular worship for a rational, modern, atheistic age. They exiled 30,000 priests out of the land, killing hundreds of others. They took nuns and publicly spanked them in the city square. In one year alone, this proto-secular state executed 17,000 men, women, and children. And when religious people protested against the anti-religious killings, General Francois took an army and killed them too. And at the end of his campaign, he said, quote, They no longer exist. I have crushed children beneath the hooves of our horses and massacred the women. The roads are littered with corpses. Secularism can be dangerous. Secularism can divide people. Secularism can cause wars. Now, of course, your reaction may be that secularism is not inherently violent. The French Revolution misused and abused secular ideas. Interesting because that's exactly what I was thinking about Christianity and the Thirty Years' War. You see, when religion does something wrong, we tend to blame religion itself. But when secularism does something wrong, we tend to just blame the people and absolve their secular ideas. How convenient. This is the myth of religious violence. The comedian George Carlin once said, more people have been killed in the name of God than for any other reason. And when he said it, the audience, they started clapping and cheering because they felt like, yeah, someone said it. Good to be honest and blunt about it. And we hear statements like that all the time and we think, yeah, I guess that's true. We just sort of take it as obvious. But check this out. In their recently published book, Encyclopedia of Wars, authors Charles Philip and Alan Axelrod document the history of recorded warfare, and from their list of 1,763 wars, only 123 have been classified to involve a religious cause, accounting for less than 7% of all wars and less than 2% of all people killed in warfare. While, for example, it is estimated that approximately 1 to 3 million people were tragically killed in the Crusades, and perhaps 3,000 in the Inquisition, nearly 35 million soldiers and civilians died in the senseless and secular slaughter of World War I alone. See, the 20th century was an experiment. We were a test. For centuries, we had been modernizing and removing religion from government because we thought that religion was the source of our problems. Religion caused the Thirty Years' War, after all. The 20th century was supposed to be the test of the secular state. It was supposed to be our first step towards our bright, modern, enlightened, secular future. But the 20th century ended up being the bloodiest century in human history. Some historians would even argue that within just a hundred years, secular states managed to kill more people than the previous 2,000 years of religion combined. Now, does that mean secularism is wrong? No. Not any more than the Thirty Years' War or the Crusades disproves Christianity. Just because some people hijack a worldview and do bad things with it doesn't disprove the worldview itself. But, then why is religion not allowed in the public sphere because of the Thirty Years' War? If both religion and secularism have the potential to lead to violence, why is one considered more valid than the other? Now, I don't think 
we should just go back to religion controlling the government. I, I don't want to go back to the 1600s, but I also don't think we should so quickly and naively embrace secularism either. Secularism has a history. So the French Revolution happened. Secularism continued to spread throughout Europe, and secularism actually did a lot of good. It helped end the Protestant Catholic argument in a lot of Europe, and helped kind of deal with the aftermath of the Protestant Reformation when the two sides were fighting. Secularism did do some good. And slowly, secularism becomes so much a part of the Western worldview that it's hard for us to even imagine what it must have been like before. We can no longer imagine how we used to do things differently. It seems obvious to us that religion should be private. Obviously, religion shouldn't be involved in schooling or public or politics. Peace and tolerance and open-mindedness. Thank you, secularism. Secularism became so obvious and unquestionable to us that we assumed it must be equally true for all people and all cultures. We assumed all countries would benefit from secularism. We need to bring secularism to the rest of the world so they can progress and become enlightened like us. So we began exporting secularism to the developing world, such as the Middle East. In Iran, in 1928, they issued the laws of the uniformity of dress so the people would look and sound like Western secularists. And what those laws meant were that Muslim women were no longer allowed to wear headdresses in public. Soldiers would literally come and rip them off of their heads. Hundreds of Muslims gathered at one of their holiest shrines to stage a peaceful protest against the dress laws. And the secular government opened fire, killing hundreds of them. If you want to know why parts of the Islamic world have been radicalized, it starts with us. Headdresses aren't actually even that big of a deal in the Quran. Secularism made it a big deal by taking it away. Turkey became a secular republic in 1918. And the secular leader of Turkey was hailed as a revolutionary and progressive and modern Western enlightened secular leader. And he soon outlawed the Muslim Sufi order and seized all of its public properties. He then abolished the public Muslim caliphate, which was central to the faith of millions of Muslims. Al-Qaeda, and then eventually ISIS, one of the reasons they were created, they literally state this as one of their goals, is to reinstate the public caliphate that was taken away from them. The horrors of secularism provoked an equally horrific response. <laughs> Which is a great irony, because today, one of the greatest arguments for secularism Whenever you're talking to someone who's very pro-secularism, they're like, look at 9-11, look at Muslim terrorists. Do you want these people running a country? Which is ironic because secularism is what helped create that counter-response in the first place. Secularism, imposing it upon another people, imposing Western secular values, radicalized their people. For decades, Western nations have been getting involved in the Middle East claiming to bring the secular values of freedom and democracy, and in the name of those Western values, we've killed hundreds of thousands of people. And because we were allegedly defending our nation, because we did it for secular reasons, we think it's okay. And see, this is what secularism is brilliant at. 
Secularism is brilliant at pretending it isn't a worldview. Most of us today, before today, didn't even know what the word secularism was because we don't identify it as a belief system. It doesn't even need a name. We just think it's common sense. People think, obviously, religion should be private. We think, obviously, you should keep your religion to yourself, and those two spheres, private and public, shouldn't mix. We've assumed it so much that we don't even think of it as a worldview. We just think it's common sense. We don't see secularism as a bias or a lens that we have. We just think it's neutral. It's the way all sensible people must see things, just how it is. And so, when we went into the Middle East and tried to make it secular, we didn't think we're imposing our worldview on them. We just thought, well, we're making them more rational. We're helping them see the world more clearly. We're doing them a favor. By not admitting that secularism is a worldview, it allows us to impose it on other people because we don't think we're enforcing our worldview on them. We just think we're helping them see the world as it is and as any rational person would see it. A worldview is most dangerous not when someone names it and forces it on you. A worldview is most dangerous when no one realizes that it's a worldview, and so you can force people into it, you can kill people for it, without even realizing what you're doing. Which is why we've had so little success in the Middle East. We're, we're coming in, we're rushing in, acting like we know everything, and, and anyone who isn't secular, anyone who doesn't agree with us, is a backwards, closed-minded bigot. All the while, we are the ones who are actually imposing our secular worldview on them, like backwards, closed-minded bigots. We, we split the world into public and private, and so when people think, hey, that artificial split is ridiculous, we have to dismiss them and say, well, you're, you're a radical, fundamentalist, backwards, uneducated, unmodern, dark-age, religious nut. But secularism is a worldview. It isn't just common sense. It was invented in the 1600s within unique social situations and constructs in response to the Thirty Years' War. Secularism is not neutral. It's not the starting ground. It's not unbiased. It isn't, it isn't neutral. It's a social construct invented by the West. It has just as much potential to divide and cause violence as any other worldview. And this is where it gets practical, if you're just like, oh, it's a history lesson. When someone tells you that the public sphere is secular and you need to shut up and keep your faith to yourself, all they are really saying is, hey, why don't you abandon your worldview and follow mine instead? I was watching a show a few months back, and there was this horrible accident in this town, and a bunch of people got killed in this small community where everyone knew each other. And in the high school in the town that week, they had an assembly where they brought everyone together, and it was sort of like a public counseling session so all the kids could kind of talk through what had happened and sort of grieve as a high school together. And so what they actually did is they handed a mic to any one of the high school students who needed to talk because they thought, well, this will help people let it out, let them vent, and this maybe inspires other people to vent. And so one of the kids, he took the microphone and he said, I just, I'm really struggling with God right now. I feel like he's with me, but I also, and then the teacher walked up, took the microphone out of his hand and said, let's keep it secular and then handed the microphone to another student. A high schooler is trying to process their grief in a way that makes sense to them, and because it's a public assembly, 
they got cut off. And it wasn't as horrific as the French Revolution, and there's no blood or guts or anything. What really struck me was just, it was a normal daily thing. I don't want to go back to the 1600s. I don't want to fight over religion. I don't want to kill over religion. I don't want to start another 30 years war. But that's not because I believe in secularism. It's because I believe in Jesus. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I don't wish that Catholics and Protestants during the Thirty Years' War had been more secular. I wish they had been more like Christ. I wish their religion would have been public and they would have talked about it openly and honestly and had good discussions, but then not needed to kill each other about it. And I don't think Jesus would have kept his faith to himself. I don't think Jesus would say the answer is to be a Christian in private and secular in public. I think that he would say, instead, we need to redefine what it means to be a Christian in public. Jesus would be public about his faith, but he wouldn't force others to believe what he said. He didn't use force to make people believe as he did. Jesus was himself killed by religious people because he didn't believe what they believed. Jesus' death is a fact in, it's a symbol against religious violence and abuse of the government authority. But yet, Jesus wouldn't have been private about his faith either. I mean, Jesus publicly overturned the tables of those greedy money collectors in the temple. And he did it in the name of God. A faith that is a solely private faith. A faith that doesn't go out into the world and try to make a difference in the world. That doesn't try to bring hope and justice to the public world of others. Is a solitary and self-focused faith. Jesus spoke about faith boldly wherever he went. In the temple. On the streets. In a crowd. Even with politicians like Pontius Pilate. He didn't compartmentalize his life and be one person in private and another in public. He wasn't one person on Sunday and another person in public the other six days. And remember when Jesus left and left us a mission? Be my witnesses. Go tell the world about me. I know that sometimes you are afraid to be a Christian in public. Because I am sometimes afraid to be a Christian in public. I know you're afraid to stand up for what you believe, afraid to talk about Jesus, afraid to be public in your witness for Christ. Our culture has been adopting secular values for hundreds of years, and so we're embarrassed to talk about God in public. We've even believed in these secular ideologies ourselves. We're afraid to be our Christian selves in the world. Worried that everyone will think we are crazy, backwards, dark age bigots. Afraid that we will be seen as too uneducated and primitive to keep our mouths shut about our faith. I know that feeling. I get that feeling every single time I pray in a restaurant. And I open my eyes and occasionally I see some people are looking at us praying and they're smirking. I get that feeling when I posted ads for our children's ministry at the bus stop, and one guy literally just started laughing out loud. Sometimes people get weird or annoyed at me simply for talking about what I did at church today, just talking about my day. They give you this look like, are you trying to convert me? Keep your faith <laughs> to yourself. Well, I'm just being me. I'm sorry I don't fit into your secular, private, public box. 
And sometimes I just want to shut down and give in and cut myself in half and be one person in private and another person in public. It would be so much easier than trying to stand up to a secular worldview that won't even admit it's a worldview. I imagine you might feel that way sometimes yourself. But Jesus says to you, be my witnesses. Be my martyrs. Walk in the tradition of me, Jesus, who got crucified for standing up in public and calling out the government. Walk in the footsteps of Paul, who got his head cut off by Nero because he refused to give in to the perversion and depravity of Nero. And Nero was sleeping around with little boys and children, and nobody would say anything. But Paul called out the sexual immorality of the empire. He spoke publicly. And eventually, they cut his head off. Be my martus, my martyrs, my witnesses. Follow in those footsteps. Don't cringe and go retreat into the private because this new worldview called secularism that doesn't think it's a worldview. And so it gets away with whatever it wants and then says, oh, that wasn't me, that was just bad people. That's crap. It's a worldview. It does good, it does bad. Just like ours. Don't let people just pretend it's common sense and try to shut you up. Jesus challenges you to question the unquestioned assumptions of our society. That's what he did and he got killed for. Even if you feel weird or awkward. You haven't been crucified yet, so you've got a little ways to go. Jesus challenges you to evaluate the worldviews that pretend not to be worldviews. To think through our history and the 30 years war and the French Revolution and let 80 history reshape how you think about the world. Jesus dares you to live a complete and holistic life, not one where you're split in half, one person in private and another in public. What kind of way to live is that? No wonder the Muslims were pissed when we tried to tell them they had to be someone else in the world. Jesus says, be my witnesses with your life with your actions, with your very soul, bear testimony to me wherever you go, in private, in public, and to the ends of the earth. Amen.